Cutman Press presents Lady Killer Written by N. Gray Read for you by Madison the AI Narrator Audio Copyright 2023 N. Gray Chapter 1 This story contains content that might trouble some readers, including but not limited to depiction of and references to sexual assault, violence, and murder. Please be mindful of these and other triggers. Practice self-care before, during, and after reading. Although this story takes place in South Africa, the spelling is in line with U.S. English. The man watched her through the restaurant window. She nervously tucked strands of hair behind her ear while ordering a drink with the server. Her smile captivated him. Affection blossomed in his chest as he hoped that this time she'd be different. She had to be. This time she'd choose him. Even in their correspondence, she spoke with respect and kindness. She seemed different in her own special way. She smiled at the server, and he couldn't help but smile at her. Yes. She was different. The man pinched the stem between his index finger and thumb, the thorn tearing his skin. He sucked the tiny wound and broke off the thorn, dropping it on the sidewalk. He inhaled and opened the door. She glanced his way when he entered the restaurant, and her smile widened when her eyes flitted from his face to the single red rose in his hands. Her expression brightened when she looked at his face again. The last couple of weeks the man had only given her snippets of his true self, a close-up of his winning smile, his powerful hands or his eyes but never his face. He waited for this moment when he presented himself to her as one charismatic package. It thrilled the man to watch her smile broaden when she realized it was him, he was the man she'd been speaking with, sharing parts of her heart and her dreams of the future. Yes, this one was different, and he would enjoy every moment with her. The man approached her table, not once taking his eyes off her. His heart had a steady beat, and hands were warm and dry. Hi, she said shyly. After all this time, I'm glad we're finally meeting. The time he'd taken from first contact until they met was done with precision and reason. He needed her wanting more. And he never rushed into a first date. You are more beautiful than your pictures, he said in a low baritone, watching his date blush. He proffered a hand. She reached for him. For a moment time stood still. She didn't want to let go when he tried to remove his hand. She swallowed hard as she raked her gaze down his body. Her thin lips curled upwards at the sides. He reveled in the chase and was only getting started. The man sat across from her, staring intently as she browsed the menu. His eyes flitted from her face to the menu cover, depicting a map of tunnels beneath Cape Town. A tunnel ran below this restaurant and was used by tourists. Have you found something you'd like to eat? He asked, glancing at the menu he knew well. He always ordered the same meal, medium-rare steak with a baked potato. I'm thinking of having the pasta, she added, placing the menu on the table. Before I forget this is yours, he said, handing her the long-stemmed red rose. It's beautiful. She graciously took the rose from him and smelled the petals. When I saw you standing there with the rose, I knew it was you. His smile reached his eyes, no doubt settling his date's nerves, and she visibly relaxed. I thought it would give me brownie points. He grinned and winked. He did. She giggled elegantly. Good, he said, glancing around for the server. I'm thinking of a bottle of red. It should go well with your pasta. His date nodded her approval, not taking her eyes off him. The man gave the server their order. While they waited, they continued their playful banter. They enjoyed a glass of wine when the server returned with the bottle, which loosened the shy woman's tongue and made her cheeks glow, her telltale sign that perhaps she didn't drink often, but the man knew not to give her too much. He wanted her consent. She had to feel as if she was in control, and he needed the chase to be real. Their food orders arrived and their conversation remained pleasant, keeping the woman comfortable in his company. Then, once they had eaten dessert and drank their coffee, he tenderly reached for her hand. Would you like to get out of here beautiful? he asked. His warm smile put her at ease. A woman as fine as you deserves the intimate touch of being spoiled by me, he said, 
adding extra charm, followed by a cocky smile. She nodded shyly. Her cheeks were still red, but the effect of the wine was long out of her system. The man grinned, pulled notes from his pocket, and placed it on the table when the bill arrived. That should cover it, he said, holding out his hand which she took without hesitation. He pulled her closer, wrapping an arm around her slender shoulder. She huddled into him, enjoying his embrace. In today's world, some women still blindly trusted men. They thought they knew someone because they messaged daily with a man through a dating app or spoke with them over the phone. Then, when they met them in real life, they assumed they could trust the man. Some women thought that by conversing with a man, they understood them, knew their habits, wants, and needs. But they didn't. It was easy for the man to sit behind his desk, his fingers dancing across his keyboard as he laid the deceitful trap and waited for his unsuspecting victim. And the fun was only beginning. Chapter 2 I hurried out of my bedroom to get to my next job, and Jewel strolled casually to the bathroom to brush her teeth. Please hurry, I said, trying not to moan. We need to go. Why, she groaned, slamming the door in my face. They're already dead, she yelled on the other side of the closed bathroom door. It's not like they're going to complain that you missed a spot. That's not the point, and you know it. Then what's the point? She mumbled. You know why, I yelled. Remind me, she said. I opened my mouth to respond when the sound of her electric toothbrush switching on, followed by her humming some tune. I exhaled a frustrated breath and shook my head. My 14-year-old tested my patience daily. If it's not taking her time on purpose, then it's rushing me so she could meet up with friends. Or rolling her eyes when I spoon vegetables onto her plate or refuse to buy fizzy cool drinks. This is my company, and Detective Bischoff asked for me personally, I said. The toothbrush was switched off and the door opened. Yuck, isn't he like old, she said, rolling her eyes. Her eyes were the same color as mine, one green, the other hazel with flecks of green near the pupil. He's near retirement age and it's not a date, I said. It's a working relationship. I frowned. Pete was a friend who helped by referring cleaning jobs to my company. He was a detective for the South African Police Service and near retirement. He always referred my company to families who needed a room cleaned where a family member had died. Some scenes were gruesome, others were just sad. Unfortunately, unless the families had insurance to pay for my services, the family paid for the cost of the cleanup. They had the option to clean the room themselves, but so far nobody wanted to. They always called me in the end. Fine, Jewel groaned as she exited the bathroom and entered her bedroom to get dressed. Does that mean I'm going to dad now already? Yes, hon, I'm sorry. I know it's my weekend, but it's only for a couple of hours. I promise I'll make it up to you. She peered around the door jam, eyebrows raised. Anything. She drawled out slowly, followed by a sly grin. I know what you're thinking and no, not anything. I will make up for it though. She alluded to tickets to a band that was coming to Cape Town Shores. I'd already said no to her going. She was only 14 and the crowd going were young adults. They served alcohol at the venue and people got up to all kinds of mischief. There was no way I'd allow my daughter to attend with much older friends. Just because I did things like that at her age didn't mean she could. You're no fun. She slammed her bedroom door. Thanks, baby cakes. I love you too. I sang as I walked past. I collected my supplies from the garage and placed them in the back of my Ford Ranger. As I came back into the house, Jewel came out of her bedroom. Her bottom lip stuck out and she averted her eyes. She slung her backpack over her shoulder and brushed past me. Just take me to dad already, she grumbled, heading towards my car. I'll be right out just getting my gloves. I wore extra strength suits when going to violent crime scenes, including industrial strength gloves. With this suit, I could work for the CDC but I'd rather be safe than sorry, Bloodborne pathogens could cause diseases should my suit tear and I got injured. I packed my bag, locked up the house and climbed into the Ford. 
Jewel was all teen doom and gloom. I could almost picture a storm cloud over her head. When something didn't go her way, she moped as she did now. I exhaled audibly, started the engine, and merged into the traffic. The trip down the main road to Will's shop was quiet for this time of the morning. It was winter, windy, and wet. I enjoyed the winter months, it was cooler and the best time to go wine tasting. Once we reached Beach Road in Strand, I saw the first signs of life, the surf club came into view. The parking spaces on both sides of the street were occupied by vehicles belonging to surfers. If the weather was good, surfers were normally out on the waves early in the morning before others enjoyed their morning walk. Today was no different, as I passed Will's shop in search of an open parking space. I found a spot and parked the car around the corner from the surf shop. The surf shop had belonged to Will's father, who died a few years ago. Will renovated the shop with the money he borrowed from me and didn't make enough profit to repay me yet. We climbed out of the car and I pressed the fob to lock it. Although I would only be gone a few minutes and the neighborhood was safe enough. Criminals still took chances when an opportunity arose. I walked with Jewel towards the entrance of the surf shop, even though she was old enough to walk the short distance without me policing her. Surfboards took up most of the space near the entrance, followed by swimming costumes, wetsuits, snorkels, and other knickknacks tourists loved to buy. There was a small coffee station on the far side where customers could buy takeaway coffee. Can I get a hug? I asked, standing in the door jam. Jewel turned around and snaked her arms around me. I clung to her like it was the end of the world. Hey honey, Will said, entering the shop from one of his back rooms. I let go of Jewel. He set the box he carried on the counter beside me. I peered inside to find it filled with cell phone covers. Branching out, I see. I pulled a pink cover with bedazzled studs out to show Jewel, and she giggled. It's winter, Will said. Business is slow. You've been saying that since you started here, I said, my words clipped. Don't start with me, Ophelia, Will said, giving me the stink eye. He brought Jewel into an embrace and kissed the top of her head. How's my favorite girl doing? I'm fine, Daddy. Mr. Jones is happy my grades have improved and welcomed me back on the Minecraft team. What, he said. I didn't know you were off the team. He glared daggers at me silently criticizing me for not telling him. Will was part of her life too. He should know what's going on, or ask her how she's doing and not assume that everything was perfect or wait for me to bring it up. It was only for the term. Jewel smiled, letting go of her father. Bye mom. Call me when you're done please. I heard the plea in her tone. She tried to smile, but I saw the disappointment in her expression. It pained me to leave her. If I didn't have this company, I wouldn't be able to afford the things I wanted to give her. At the moment, I didn't have anyone to watch over her and would never leave her home alone. Will was my only backup babysitter. When Jewel disappeared around the back, Will leaned towards me, his breath reeking of beer. He held out his hand and said, Can you spare some change? What do you need this time? I asked, rolling my eyes. I want to buy Jewel a pizza or something. Maybe she and I can have fun while you're out doing who knows what. Work Will, I work hard for the money I give you. I snapped, slapping his outstretched hand away and pulled out my cell phone. I don't have cash on me, but I'll transfer money into your account. Only enough for pizza. And a bottle of wine for me, he said, wearing an obnoxious smile. Buy your own damn alcohol with your own money. Oh come on, he grumbled. See, this is why we never stayed together. No, I pointed my index finger into his chest, we divorced when I realized you were a leech and would never amount to anything. The only reason I keep you around, I bit my tongue when Jewel entered the shop, earphones in her ears, but the expression she wore told me she had heard. I exhaled and counted to ten. I swiped my phone open and tapped on the banking app. When I raised my phone to my face, it automatically entered my account. Sending Will money daily was killing my credit score rating. I sent enough money for a pizza and glared at Will. His scowl only fueled my anger. 
To get to Jewel, I moved around Will, but he stood like a statue, blocking my path. Get out of my way, I said through gritted teeth, glaring at him. When he didn't move, I pushed him. I reached for Jewel and brought her in for another hug. Bye, hun, mama loves you, I said, kissing the top of her head and dragging a strand of her hair through my fingers. Watch your dad. It seems he needs the babysitter. I brushed past Will again, elbowing him in his side, and left my daughter with her deadbeat dad. Will yelled something as I left, but I ignored the insult. I didn't want to get into another fight with him, in front of Jewel. She'd gone through enough these few years, and I didn't think it was worth the effort. Instead, I showed his shot my middle finger and felt instantly better. I climbed into my new vehicle and exhaled a frustrated breath. I had purchased the vehicle recently, and Will kept asking about it. He'd moaned I had money to buy a new Ford, but not enough to help him out. What he failed to understand, I needed a car large enough for my gear and sometimes the locations we were called to were remote. If I purchased a van it could get stuck on the gravel road if it was wet. Plus I was paying off the Ford monthly, I didn't pay cash for it up front. My cell phone beeped, and I pulled it out of my pocket. Lucy, my business partner, sent me a text message saying she would be a few minutes late. I shook my head and threw my cell phone into the center console. This was another scene I'd have to do alone. Chapter 3 The road to the small farm holding in Stellenbosch, near Polka Dry Strawberry Farm and Spear Wine Farm, was scenic. The road on both sides had vineyards and farms surrounded by mountains. I'd driven this road plenty of times before when I indulged in wine tastings. But lately, I'd been so busy with work I hadn't had time to do grocery shopping, never mind indulging in the latest wines. The tires of my Ford crunched on the gravel as I drove up the secluded driveway. The victim lived on a small farm holding between wine farms. On the property, they had a greenhouse filled with plants to the right. I parked behind one of the South African police service cars and collected my things out of the back. Hi, Miss Ophelia, Jacob said, leaning his bicycle against a tree and approached. Let me help. Thanks, Jacob. I handed him the cleaning equipment and bucket. I didn't know you were coming today. Miss Lucy said you might need my help. Okay, great, I said with a smile even though it angered me that Lucy might not make it. Did you ride your bicycle all the way here? Yes, Miss Ophelia, he smiled. His teeth were the whitest I'd ever seen. His skin was dark and smooth for a man of almost fifty. My home was nearby. He pointed at an area in the distance known as Blue Downs, where gangsterism was on the rise. I'd forgotten Jacob lived there. Every day he battled the streets on his bike to get to the taxi rank, and then to the crime scene to help clean. And no matter how many times I told him to call me Ophelia, he continued calling me Miss Ophelia. Have you gone for your driver's license yet? I asked as I removed our suits. I'm going on Tuesday. Good, let me know if you get it and I'll bring my old car to you. And in the meantime, we need to find you another accommodation. What happened to the room we arranged with the estate agent? It was already taken he said without looking at me. I set my things down again in the back of my Ford and pulled out my cell phone. I dialed the number of an acquaintance who worked in real estate. When I got hold of her, I asked her to find accommodation for Jacob and that both he and I would view the property together. I told her about his situation and she browsed the rentals while I waited for her feedback. She gave me details for properties close to my home in Somerset West and another one in Gordon's Bay. I sighed as I imagined how hard it was for Jacob when I felt this way. Unfortunately, there were still those who felt they were superior based on the color of their skin, making the lives of others that much harder. I might not have been born in South Africa, but I was a South African. I understood the hardships of the majority, but I also hated politics and avoided the subject when brought up. All I wanted, apart from world peace, was for everyone to treat each other with love, kindness, and compassion. When we're done here, we're going to see a place near me and one in Gordon's Bay, I said once I made the arrangements with the owners. 
he turned around and smiled, his eyes shining like stars. Thank you Miss Ophelia, I'd like that. My pleasure, Jacob. And I know you feel uncomfortable phoning me, but you must when things don't work out. I can help. I thought you had already moved into the small apartment last week, during your leave. Jacob nodded, turned around and headed towards the house. He was a timid man, who never said a bad thing about anyone. And he was a hard worker. He started working for me as my gardener, and when I started working as a crime scene cleaner, I offered him a job with a substantial pay increase. He could afford to buy himself a car and rent a three-bedroom apartment, but he preferred to save money so that I could send a portion of it to his family, who still lived in Mozambique. Although Jacob was a South African citizen, he met his wife when the army sent him to Mozambique. For now, they would stay there until he bought himself a house and then reunite with his wife and children. Detective Pete Bischoff exited the house, slapped Jacob on the shoulder in greeting, and approached me. Do you need a hand? he asked, taking the biohazard container out of my hands without waiting for my answer. Hi Pete thanks, I closed the back of the Ford and followed him inside. You were very vague on the phone. What kind of crime scene is this? I glanced at my surroundings, noting the grass and flower bed needed water. He exhaled and shook his head. I'd never seen him this frazzled before. It's nothing I've seen before oh, Pete struggled to say my name with his Afrikaans accent and resorted to just calling me oh, reminding me of Oprah. I smiled but I quickly squashed it when I smelled the stench. Jacob had already started setting everything up outside the house near the front door. I handed him a suit and he started climbing into it. I poked my head through the door and bile rose, forcing me to swallow hard. Yeah, it's a bad one. Pete set the biohazard container on the ground near the door. Her air conditioner was left on a hot temperature for two days before the helper found her body. He exhaled frustratingly. And to think I wanted to retire this month. He rubbed his eyes, then his cheeks. If I don't solve this one, it will keep haunting me until I die. I'd seen my fair share of bloody crime scenes, but whatever had happened to this victim was gruesome. There was blood everywhere and from that glimpse some parts were still moist. Is the case that bad? Yeah, Pete said deep in thought. One of the worst I've seen in all the years I've worked as a detective. That meant a lot coming from Pete. Does that mean you're staying on the case until you catch the killer? Pete nodded and his shoulders sagged, his job clearly weighing him down. They had more cases coming in daily than they could solve. As a detective, he had to be involved in most homicide cases or assist others when there was a staff shortage. This case was a recent addition to his workload. I wanted to change the subject, and it was one I didn't like. Thanks for calling. Who do I send the invoice to? I hated asking, but before we started cleaning I needed to handle the administration. The victim has insurance that will cover it, he said handing me a piece of paper with the authorization number and contact person. Thanks. I pocketed the document and climbed into my suit. When Jacob and I dressed in our personal protective gear, we entered the house. Pete stood to one side with an officer who was busy packing his items away. He had been dusting for fingerprints, but from the looks of it there were none for him to collect. The two spoke in hushed tones, and I could only imagine what had happened to this poor woman to elicit such a reaction from the police. Are you sure you don't need the scene again? I asked loud enough for them to hear. I needed their confirmation that they were happy for us to clean the evidence. Yes, we got enough. The technicians have another case they had to rush off to, Pete said, signing a document and handing it to the officer. I can't stay. He neared, placing his large hands on his hips, his gut hanging slightly over his belt. Pete rubbed his face with one hand and scratched his mustache, his bald head shining in the sunlight. I have a gang shooting in Delft, near the airport. They caught the gang members, but they need help to secure the area. We'll be fine, I said. Good luck. My words came out muffled through the respirator. I have an officer who will stay here until you finish. He needs to take pictures for the insurance company, and then he'll lock up. 
If you need him, his name is Dumi. He thumbed at the officer behind him. Dumi stood with his hands in his pockets, surveying the area like he was waiting for snipers to jump out of the shadows. We'll be fine. I smiled but knew he couldn't see it, so I gave him a thumbs up. Have a good day. He didn't reply, as he left us standing there with our buckets and cleaning material. I turned to Jacob and pointed to my left. You start that side and I'll start this side. Yes, Miss Ophelia. Jacob picked up his equipment and headed for the bloodstains on the floor near the TV cabinet. The lounge was an open-plan area shared with the kitchen. There were two couches, a TV stand, and a six-seater dining table. The house had modern furnishings, recently spoiled by the victim's blood, which covered most of the floor area from the floating kitchen island to the other side near the TV. I shuddered when I saw the darkest pool of blood with strange markings where I assumed the body had been. We cleaned slowly and carefully. I found nail clippings and brain matter in the corner near the kitchen, and something that reminded me of an organ. I scooped it up in a towel and discarded it in the biohazard container. I was grateful I couldn't smell much with the positive pressure airflow full face respirator mask I'd bought. They were expensive but worth it. To the person on the street, Jacob and I seemed like large white marshmallows, but our suits protected us from everything. We used fast-acting granules which got into the tiniest of cracks, absorbing any liquid or spilt blood easily and safely. Once that was done, we scrapped the granules with the blood spill and used paper towels to clean the mess. We threw all the paper towels in the biohazard container and continued until the floor was void of red gunk. Then we cleaned again. After two hours of scrubbing, wiping and mopping, I met Jacob at the halfway mark in the living room. Sweat peppered my forehead and clothing clung to my body. The suits made us hot, especially when we worked this hard. I glanced down at the floor. It needed to dry before we mopped the fourth and final time. While we waited for it to dry, I instructed Jacob to check all the furniture for any blood splatter. He needed to check photo frames, furniture legs, and even cushions. If there was any drop of blood, we had to either clean it or discard the items. It was our job to ensure the room was spotless. If there was a family living with the victim, they shouldn't be able to tell someone had died here. And if they were selling the house, the new owners shouldn't find any evidence to the fact. We prided ourselves in doing our best while ensuring our safety. While Jacob checked the furniture in the living room, I inspected the kitchen. When we had first arrived, at a glance, I could tell the murder scene took place in the living space, but I wanted to make sure nothing had spilt over into the kitchen. The gray tiles had no flecks of red. The kitchen cabinets were still white with clear glass doors. The counter was spotless, although there was a mug near the kettle with a tea bag inside. I glanced at the front door and back at the mug, and although I wasn't a detective, I always tried to envision what had happened at a scene. Perhaps she had a visitor, but there was only one mug out. Unless it was an unexpected visit, yet the lock on the door was still intact. I walked around the corner where the washing machine, dishwasher and dryer stood under the counter. Inside the sink were two champagne glasses. My brow furrowed. I didn't recall seeing any pictures of the victim with a partner, they were mainly pictures of her family and a dog. I exited the back door and whistled. No dog ran up to me. With my hands on my hips, I exited out the back door and found two empty dog bowls. I traversed down the stairs and headed towards the greenhouse out back. The neatly cut grass was turning white, with various flower beds positioned along the path towards the greenhouse. The owner had taken pride in their garden, but the soil looked dry. The door to the greenhouse was closed. When I yanked it open, a wave of heat smacked into me, stealing my breath. Even with the suit, I felt the inferno. The plants inside the greenhouse had withered and died. From their condition, Pete's assumption that the owner had been dead for a couple of days before being discovered was true. The windows were closed, and there was no ventilation. I had no green thumbs and knew little about plants, but something didn't feel right. I entered the greenhouse, and a familiar stench caught me off guard, making me wish I had never removed my mask. 
Heading towards the back of the greenhouse, I found the cause of the stink. I removed my gloves and sent Pete a text.